look at part 14 in our Investigating Babylon series. Okay. So as just as a quick reminder, we already went through the first seven parts of this, which was the past. We talked about a lot of the things going on in history about the Tower of Babel and what started happening after that throughout history. And now we're going through, this is uh, part 14. So this is the, the last installment of the present part of this series. Okay. So we've been looking at things pertaining to the present and, um, and how mystery Babylon is still active and still involved all throughout the world. And then the next seven episodes, we're going to be looking at the future. Okay. So this is like I've shown before, just the, the European union, kind of funny that they actually built a replica um, of what most people thought the Tower of Babel was to an unfinished version of the Tower of Babel, what they thought it looked like. And the European Union, being an amalgamation of countries and languages, decided to build that in <laughs> as an homage, apparently. I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty telling, in my opinion. But if you've been watching this series, you you know just how telling it is. It's it's not just telling, it's it's 100 percent fitting. So Let's look at the history of the Jesuits. Okay, guys, this is a group that is an offshoot, literally a militant offshoot arm of the papacy, of the Vatican, specifically the Pope. So we're going to be looking at this. Um, if you've watched this channel for any amount of time, you know that we are not Catholics on this channel. And um, we we have shown and uh, expounded upon the different ways that Catholicism for the last 17, 1800 years has corrupted the faith of Yeshua, those who are trying to follow Yeshua in discipleship and purity according to the word, the Torah, the prophets, uh, they've corrupted that completely, and they promote a different version of what, you know, first AD Yeshua was and what his disciples practiced and preached. So that doesn't mean that everyone in the Catholic Church has a corrupt heart. That doesn't mean that everyone that's raised in the Catholic Church doesn't want to know God. That doesn't mean that I know that was a double negative, guys, but please bear with me. That I'm not trying to throw a blanket over everyone that's in Catholicism, no matter how many good-hearted yet unfortunately deceived and innocent people that are in there that don't realize some of the, the details of their faith are very contrary to the word because most Catholic churches do not actually have their people reading the word. So people just want to know God. They just go to the building and they think, oh, this is these people here talking about God. I want to know God. Unfortunately, they, they may wind up in that church or their family invited them or something, or they were raised in it and didn't really know um, that there's a lot of man-made traditions and not a lot of scripture going on. So this is why there's a lot of people that have, quote, unquote, come out of the Catholic Church and realized that, hey, you know, I want to actually follow the Bible. And that's how you know God. So we pray for those people. But at the same time, I'm showing you I'm going to be showing you tonight within the Catholic Church and other organizations there is a lot of corruption. There's a lot of anti-biblical concepts, and it actually traces all the way back to ancient Babylon. So this is, we're going to look real quick at the history of the Jesuits and the Jesuits themselves. Between 1555 and 1931, the Society of Jesus, which is the, the technical name for the Jesuit order. Um, and just because they use the word Jesus, guys, doesn't mean they're doing an honor. It doesn't mean they're doing it scripturally. It doesn't mean they're doing it justice. Um, they're abusing that name, even the transliterated English version of that name. They're abusing it, guys. They're not actually behaving like Yeshua behaved, okay? So they're just using that. And there's actually a ton of controversy. I'm not going to, I don't have time to go into that, but there was a ton of controversy when they declared themselves in the 1550s. They declared themselves the Society of Jesus. A lot of other people thought it was heretical, that it was horrible. They were like, no, don't do that. Um, so just keep in mind that uh, that's what they call themselves. And it's, in my opinion, when we're going to read what they're doing and saying, it, it's just mockery because um, they're not behaving like the Father or the Son. It's horrible. Between 1555 and 1931, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuit Order, was expelled from at least 83 countries, city-states and cities, for engaging in political intrigue and subversion plots against the welfare of the state. According to the records of the Jesuit priests of repute, and this is from Thomas J. Campbell, Practically every instance of expulsion was for political intrigue, political infiltration, political subversion, and inciting to political insurrection. Sounds like BLM. The Jesuits are known for their deception, spine, infiltration, assassination, and revolution. Sounds like Lenin. Sounds like a lot of people that we could talk point to in the 20th century and 21st century. It says they worked deep into the political field and plotted through politics throughout the world countries. And this is from the Babington plot by J.E.C. Shepard on page 12. 
All right, guys. So let's continue to go here. The Jesuit oath and induction ceremony. Okay. A lot of people may be familiar with this, but you may not have read the fullness of it. This is actually documented in the Library of Congress. I think it's 1882 was the first time it was documented. So this is not conspiracy page. This is literally documented in the Library of Congress. I'm about to read to you. So to become a Jesuit, they're going to take this oath and then they go through this induction ceremony. And this is also the same ceremony and oath that's shared, as you see on screen here, by the Knights of Malta and the Knights of Columbus. And we're going to talk about people that are in those organizations as well. It's basically just offshoots of the same concept. So, guys, remember, it's all about branding. The enemy is famous for taking, just like we talked about in like episode 10 or episode 7, we talked about the King of Babylon. And we talked about how he rebranded himself under different names in different countries because they spoke different languages and they had different cultures. So therefore the trappings of what, you know, what that quote unquote little G God that he went out, the King of Babylon went out to portray himself as a God over the people and ruler over the people and, and literally, a, you know, a God with more power than them. Um, he rebranded himself everywhere he went. So that's why he would have, a, he would put on different makeup, different clothes for the Egyptians versus the Indians versus the Akkadians versus the Greeks. This is why he's, all the same behavior, all the same Babylonian principles of destructive, sinful behavior is documented in all those countries. They have the same religious practices, but the people that they worshiped, they call them by different names. Okay. So this is how you rebrand yourself for deception. Okay. So this is the same thing the Jesuits have done over time where they rebranded themselves because as I just read, some other people caught on 83 different countries over time caught on. To the point where they're like, yeah, we don't like these dudes. They're, they're constantly meddling in our affairs and trying to do political insurrection, political subversion. So then what do they have to do? They have to do a rebranding campaign. And the offshoots that came from that are organizations like the Knights of Malta and the Knights of Columbus. Um, all right, so let's go into this actual oath. This is the Jesuit oath, guys. It documented in the Library of Congress. This is not me making this up. This is not from a conspiracy website. So I'm going to read this. Bear with me. Um, it's a, it's not too long, but I'm going to read this here. It says, I, and then you would insert your name if you're going to go through this oath, right? It says, I now in the presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed Mark, Michael the Archangel, and the Blessed St. John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles, St. Peter, and St. Paul, and all the saints and sacred hosts of heaven, and to you, my ghostly father, the superior general of the Society of Jesus, founded by St. Ignatius Loyola in the pontificate of Paul III, and continued to the present, do by the womb of the Virgin, the matrix of God, and the rod of Jesus Christ, declare and swear that His Holiness the Pope is Christ's vice regent and is the true and only head of the Catholic or universal church throughout the earth, and that by virtue of the keys of binding and loosening given to the Holiness by my Savior, Jesus Christ, He has power to depose heretical kings, princes, states, commonwealths, and governments, all being illegal without His sacred confirmation, that they may be safely be destroyed. This is crazy, guys. Oops, one second. He says, Therefore, to the utmost of my power, I shall and will defend this doctrine of his holiness's right and custom against all usurpers of the heretical or Protestant authority, whatever, especially the Lutheran of Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and now pretended authority in churches of England and Scotland, and the branches of the same now established in Ireland and on the continent of America and elsewhere. All adherents in regard that they be usurped and heretical, opposing the sacred mother church of Rome. Guys, this is <laughs> this this is the same the same mentality that I see when I debate Trinitarians. Um, you are out of out of their allegiance. You are out of their church if you disagree with their doctrine, and you're called her heretics. It's crazy. I do now renounce and disown any allegiance as due to any heretical king, prince, or state named Protestants or liberals or obedience to any of the laws, magistrates, or officers. I do further declare that the doctrine of the churches of England and Scotland and of the Calvinists, the Huguenots, and others of the name Protestants or liberals to be damnable and they themselves damned who will not forsake the same. He goes on in this oath to say, I do further declare that I will help, assist, and advise all or any of his holiness's agents in any place wherever I shall be, in Switzerland, Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, England, Ireland, or America, or any other kingdom or territory I shall come to, and do my uttermost to extirpate, extirpate the heretical Protestants or liberal doctrines and to destroy all their pretended powers, regal or otherwise. I do further promise and declare that notwithstanding, I am dispensed with to assume my religion heretical for the propaganda of the Mother Church's interests. To keep secret and private all her agents' counsels from time to time 
as they may entrust me and not to divulge directly or indirectly by word or writing or circumstance, whatever, but to execute all that shall be proposed, given in charge or discovered unto me by you, my ghostly father, or any of his sacred covenants. I want to stop real quick, guys. I don't know if y'all saw what I'm what I put on screen here, but um, I'm going to read that one more time. Okay, L listen closely to what this oath is saying, and it's very, in the middle of it. He says, "I do further promise and declare that, notwithstanding, I am dispensed with to assume my religion heretical for the propaganda of the Mother Church's interest." So to my understanding, the way this reads to me, this is a spy. This is spy language for him to say his religion is adherence to the Mother Rome Catholic Church, like you just talked about, right? So therefore, he's saying, notwithstanding I'm dispensed with, I do promise and declare that notwithstanding I'm dispensed with, to assume my religion heretical for the propaganda of the Mother Church's interests. So if Mother Church Rome decides that they need to send you somewhere to fulfill an interest, and as a part of that mission, you need to consider Mother Church's religion heretical, meaning that it's that it's not true, right? That you act like Catholicism is not true, well, then that's your assignment. That is a spy. Someone that acts like the person that sent them they have no allegiance to or don't believe them or don't give them any authority or credit. It's crazy. All right. So, but this is just explaining from, you know, 15, uh, 16th century language, you know, kind of uh, not translated, but just kind of brought into modern English. It's basically, this would be the oath that a spy is taking. Okay. He says, um, and of course, to keep secret and private all her agents counsels from time to time as they may entrust me and to not to divulge directly or indirectly by word, writing or circumstance, whatever, but to execute all that should be proposed, given in charge or discovered to me by you, my ghostly father, or any of his sacred covenants. I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion or will of my own or any mental reservation whatsoever, even as a corpse or cadaver, but will unhesitantly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope and of Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you right now, guys, Jesus Christ has no militia, right? This is, of course, blasphemy to the actual true scriptures. This is why it's I called it mockery at the very beginning. Um, and, of course, there's not supposed to be a militia of the Pope. The militia of Yeshua is the angels in heaven that come back to rout out these dudes at the end of days. And I'm going to explain that as we go into the future episodes. But ultimately, yeah, this is there is no militia of Jesus Christ. This is why they're profaning the name of God everywhere they go. This is why more atheists are made from Catholics than any other belief set. It's horrible. That I may go to any part of the world where whithersoever I may be sent to the frozen regions of the north, the burning sands of the desert of Africa, or the jungles of India, to the centers of civilization of Europe, or to the wild haunts of the barbarous savages of America, without murmuring or repining, and will be submissive in all things whatsoever communicated to me. I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics. I will rip up their stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate forever their execrable race. This is getting pretty crazy, right? That when the same cannot be done openly... I will secretly use the poison cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the poniard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed to do so by an agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus, in confirmation of which I hereby dedicate my life, my soul, and all my corporal powers with this dagger which I now receive. I will subscribe my name written in my blood. Did you guys hear that? So now it's literally a blood oath. So he's opened himself up as a part of this induction ceremony to actually, with this dagger that he just received, that, by the way, the, the Jesuit uh, symbol has a whole bunch of daggers, some straight and some crooked. So he's made, with this dagger that I receive 
and with his own blood, he's writing this testimony thereof. He said, should I prove false or weaken to my determination? May my brethren and fellow soldiers of the militia of the Pope cut off my hands and my feet and my throat from ear to ear, my belly opened and my and sulfur burned in, therein. With all the punishment that can be inflicted upon me on earth and my soul be tormented by demons in eternal hell forever. They take this seriously, guys. They're absolutely brainwashed into a cult by the Pope. This is the Jesuit Oath. The 1500s. And guys, I promise you, this didn't start in the 1500s. He goes on to say at the very end of it, all of which I, and this person would insert their name as a part of the ceremony, do swear by the blessed Trinity <laughs> and blessed sacraments, which I am now to receive, to perform on my part, to keep inviolable, and to do call all the heavenly and glorious host of heaven to witness the blessed sacrament of the Eucharist and witness the same further with my name written with the point of this dagger dipped in my own blood and sealed in the face of this holy covenant. Guys, this is literally a covenant of death. Put in the put in the uh, the chat if y'all remember this the verse um the verse that talks about those who make a covenant with death. I can't remember. But then it goes on, all right? That was that was the actual oath that the inductee is supposed to say, and then the actual person doing the ceremony, which is called the superior in this moment, this is the person that um, would would finish part of the ceremony. And he goes on to say, then the inductee receives the wafer from the superior and writes his name with the point of his dagger dipped in his own blood taken from over his heart. Superior says to him, you will now rise to your feet, and I will instruct you in the catechism necessary to make yourself known to any member of the Society of Jesus belonging to this rank. In the first place, you as a brother Jesuit will with another mutually make the ordinary sign of the cross as an ordinary Roman Catholic would. Then one cross his wrists, the palm of his open hand, his hands open, and then the other in answers, in answer crosses his feet, one above the other. The first points with forefinger of the right hand to the center of the palm of the left, the other with the forefinger of the left hand points to the center of the palm of the right. The first then with his right ankles makes a circle around his head, touching it. Excuse me, with his right hand makes a circle around his head, touching it. The other then with the forefinger of his left hand touches the left side of his body just below his heart. The first then with his right hand draws it across the throat of the other and the latter then with the dagger down the stomach and abdomen of the first. The first then says, Istum, and the other answers, Nekar, the first, Reges, and the other answers, Impious the meaning of which has already been explained. The first will then present a small piece of paper folded in a peculiar manner four times, with the, which the other will cut longitudinally, and an opening the name Jesu will be found written upon the head and arms of a cross three times. You will then give and receive with him the following questions and answers. And, by, and guys, I'm sure some of you in the chat have probably noticed that uh, the word Jesu is used by Judaism, and they, they it's that is the name that they in blasphemy intentionally give to Yeshua of Nazareth. They don't want to call him Yeshua. They want to they shorten it to Jesu because supposedly it's an insult to him. Many of you guys probably are aware of that. So then it goes on that in this ceremony he gets a question. He says the, the superior questions the inductee. He asks him from where do you come from? The, and the inductee answers the holy faith. The superior would ask whom do you serve? The initiate, the inductee would ask this say the Holy Father at Rome, the Pope, the Roman Catholic Church Universal throughout the world. Who commands you? The successor of St. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Society of Jesus, or the soldiers of Jesus Christ. Who received you? A venerable man in white hair. How? With a naked dagger. I kneeling upon the cross beneath the banners of the Pope and of our sacred order. Did you take an oath? I did, to destroy heretics and their governments and rulers, to spare neither age, sex, nor condition, to be as a corpse without any opinion or will of my own, but to implicitly obey my superiors in all things without hesitation or of murmuring. Will you do that? And I will. This is what he says in the ceremony towards the, towards the end of it after they take the oath. He then finishes by, he's asked, how do you travel? And he says, in the bark of Peter the fisherman. He says, where do you travel? To the four corners of the globe. For what purpose? To obey the orders of my general and superiors and execute the will of the Pope and faithfully fulfill the conditions of my oath. And then the superior concludes with, Go ye then into all the world and take possession of all the lands in the name of the Pope. Who He who will not accept him as the vicar of Jesus and his vice regent on earth, let him be accursed and exterminated. That was the Jesuit oath, guys. And here is a picture from 1933 of the papacy in the German Reich. And as you see on here on the left, this is Cardinal Parcelli. He's Pope Pius X. The guy to the next him right here is his name is Franz von Papen, and uh, we're going to talk about him in just a little bit. 
And then over here to the right, the dude standing up that um, looks like an absolute gamma male. That is Pope Paul the sixth uh, later down the road. So this is when he's young before he becomes the Pope, right? So this is same thing with uh, um, the Cardinal Parcelli. He hasn't become the Pope yet in this picture. So there's two people that become Popes later in their life pictured in a treaty that's been made with, in 1933 with the German Reich, which consequently led to the rise of Hitler. And so this is implicit. This was a highly controversial treaty that the uh, the papacy made with the German Reich. And this is implicit um, during that time that they were supporting them and helping them. And then things changed once Hitler took over and Hitler started per persecuting uh, Catholic churches because of uh, he didn't like the Jesuits. Basically, they, you know, their spy activities interrupted with his um, with his internal secret police. Right. So. Uh, and eventually that treaty fell apart. But the point is, it was initial collaboration there. And Franz von Papen, this is, I just, I didn't have time to go into a complete biography of this guy. I just want to let you guys know that this dude, I don't know why I've never heard about this guy before, um, you know, doing this full on study and, and trying to get into the details. But this guy was just absolutely a, a Jesuit through and through. From what we just read, like he was an international spy in South America, Central America, even North America, even into Canada. Um, and in, I think in Ireland at one point, kicked out of multiple countries uh, because of his revolutionary dissonant behavior with those different places, trying to blow up train depots, bridges, different types of things throughout World War I, as well as in between World War I and World War II. He actually became German Chancellor, which is why he was in that picture in 1933 that we just showed um, later and had you know connections with, with the, pap the papacy of, of the Vatican. Um, and then once Hitler took over, he became a high-level Nazi, an SS. Okay, after the war, nineteen, I think it was 1950, 1947, um, West Berlin or West Germany, I should say, they had uh, denazification -Naz de courts, and he was convicted for war crimes, um, assisting you know the Third Reich. So this guy was. <laughs> He was, uh, this is, is just an example of what we were talking about. This is just an example. He was born German, raised German, a Catholic, to the point where he was acknowledged by the papacy. But before he became, he was put in a, p a position of chancellorship and power in Germany, he was all over the North and South America doing what Jesuits do. The point is, guys, the whole purpose, like we just read that oath, they can be sent anywhere in the world. And they're sent to, pass, if they have to, according to their mission, deny their allegiance to Catholicism, to mother their their belief in Mother Holy Roman Church of, of Rome. So this is called spies, literally spies. This is not what the Bible teaches. This is opposite of what the Bible teaches, but this is directly goes back to the papacy. We go here. Uh, this guy, everyone recognizes this guy. And this was uh, one of his statements. He says, above all, I've learned from the Jesuits. And so did Lenin, too. For as I recall, the world has never known anything quite so splendid as the hierarchical structure of the Catholic Church. There are quite a few things I simply appropriated from the Jesuits for the use of the party. And this is from Manfred Barthel in his book, The Jesuits, The History and Legend of the Society of Jesus from 1984, page 266. This guy, Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio of Argentina, was elected Pope Francis on March 13, 2013, and he is the first openly documented Jesuit to be elected Pope. I believe he's not the first. I think he's the first openly, but they claim he's the first. I just think that, you know, <laughs> I just think that is, they think people are not going to catch on at this point. They're in, they're in every part of facets of society, government, military, all over the place. I'm going to, as I'm going to go show you here in a minute. So I just don't think that they care to, to people don't know what Jesuits are. Um, the average person, they're too busy watching family guy and, and, you know, TikTok. So no one's paying attention. Um, so this guy was openly a Jesuit and he's nominated as the Pope. Abe Lincoln said, it's not against the Americans of the South alone I'm fighting. It's more against the Pope of Rome, his perfidious Jesuits, and their blind and bloodthirsty slaves that we have to defend ourselves. 
This is from uh, the book 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Charles Chenequi, page 496. Also uh, about Lincoln, it says, It would seem that the Jesuits had it in mind from the beginning of the American Civil War to find occasion for the taking of Mr. Lincoln, Mr. Abraham Lincoln, to the assassination of it. Uh, this is also from the source of uh, Thomas M. Harris. He was a U.S. Army Brigadier General, and he's the author of the book Rome's Responsibility for the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln. It's quite the claim from a Brigadier General. So we go back a little bit in the history, and we look at this guy. It's It says... It is of faith that the Pope has the right of deposing heretical and rebel, rebel kings. Well, that sounds exactly like the oath that we just read. It says monarchs are so deposed by the Pope. Monarchs so deposed by the Pope are converted into notorious tyrants and may be killed by the first who can reach them. If the public cause cannot meet with its defense and the death of a tyrant, it's lawful for the first who arrives to assassinate him. And this is from a guy whose name's I think it was Francis, uh, Francisco Suarez, but he was just referred to as Jesuit Suarez. In his book um, in the 1600s, uh, Defensio de Day, uh, this is book six, C4, page 13 and 14. <laughs> this is the statement of a Jesuit affirming the Jesuit oath, basically acknowledging that they are openly telling people they're assassins, their political subversion, and assassins, like sent by the Pope directly. This, this, this is information that's just out there. So this is a cute little uh, diagram that I found that someone put together in a book. Um, it's got Avril Manhattan. It's from his book, The Vatican Billions. And it says, we've all, some of you may have heard about this idea of the quote-unquote black Pope or the um, the, the idea that the, the Pope that we see in the forefront is just like the stage guy, the, the stage presence, but there's actually another guy that's kind of running the scene. And so this just gives you a breakdown of the control arms throughout the whole world um, through different set for the Jesuits, directly from the papacy to the Jesuits. And then from there it breaks off and the Jesuits become into these institutions, not just the Illuminati, but the CFR, the international bankers, uh, the mafia itself, the club of Rome, Opus Deo. We're going to talk about some of those here in a minute, the Masons and also any other forms of new age movement because they're enacting strategic plans for um, creating instability in countries, it's political diversion, political infiltration. And many times that's done through cultural movements and not just simply through um bills that are passed or through having to certain person get elected or through assassinations, but it's going to be done through cultural movements. That's why um, many people already are well aware that the CIA was heavily involved in the, in the Aquarius hippie cultural movement in the United States in the 1960s. And yes, we're going to do direct ties to the CIA here in just a minute or here right now, I should say. Project Monarch. This is one of the CIA's projects. It's hard to see. It's so much as trying to fit on one page here. Project Monarch is a U.S. Defense Department codename assigned to a subsection of the Central Intelligence Agency's Operation Artichoke, which later became Project MKUltra, whereas Project Monarch was officially dedicated sometime in the early 60s by the U.S. Army. Project Monarch is a ge genealogical approach to define transgenerational, which is genetic psychology, a behavioral modification through trauma-based psychological mind control. The original documentation which spawned this project was derived from collective intensive research previously performed by top SS German Nazi scientists from 1927 to 1941. As the result of their interest in the multi-generational effects of occult psychology as applied in the nuclear family of known pedophiles, the identified leader of this research was an SS officer by the name of Hindler. This German top secret or government top secret black arts research was originally considered to be a significant bonus by product of the U.S. Department of Defense's Project 63, which is also known as Project Natural, Natural excuse me, Project National Interest. Project 63 was dictated to the secret importation of a group of German Nazi and Italian fascist scientists. This was accomplished in 1959 so as to reunite these scientists with their captured comrades from World War II. These scientists, scientists' areas of expertise were primarily, excuse me, um, these scientists' areas of expertise were primarily physics, rocket R&D, and psychiatry, mind control, psychological warfare, and microbiology and pharmacology. Oh, pharmacology, microbiology, and mind control all in one? That sounds like 2021. 
So this is Project Monarch in its origin and its inception. Okay. It goes on to MK Ultra, like it talked about, it kind of morphed into another facet of the program. I promise you, Project Monarch is still going. That's why I had the, the Hollywood sign up there. Okay. <laughs> Trauma based mind control from birth. This is why so many programs, literally the word program is intentional. And so many programs and TVs and movies push things at children that creates behavioral modification and they create cartoons with it. They create, I mean, that was the earliest form of all this from the fifties and sixties was cartoons were watched by kids and adults. Um, it was a huge deal because it was cheaper to make, you know what I'm saying? It was easier. They could just put the sound effects with the, all the drawings. Whereas that's, that starts early in a, in a person's life to start doing that behavioral modification over time, psychological warfare. It's a form of mind control. So this is why the government and the, and the CIA specifically has been heavily connected and specifically the military has been heavily connected to Hollywood since its inception. Okay. It later morphed into something called MK ultra and the CIA began to experiment with LSD, which is lysergic acid dihydylamide. I don't know if I said that right under agency chemist and poison expert, Sidney Gottlieb. He believed the agency could harness the drugs, mind altering properties for brainwashing or psychological torture. Under the auspices of Project MK Ultra, the CIA began to fund studies at Columbia University, Stanford University, and other colleges on the effects of the drug. After a series of tests, the drug was deemed too unpredictable for use in counterintelligence. MK Ultra also included experiments with ecstasy, mescaline, heroin, barbiturates, methamphetamines, and psilocybin, which is mushrooms, magic mushrooms. So this was the idea of MK Ultra, at, at an offshoot of trying to, they, they went from trying to create propaganda through film, TV, and movies, and cartoons to saying, let's just directly go to the college kids and get them high and see what we can do. And this was done to a lot of people without their consent, without their knowledge. Sometimes to the point of capturing people, taking them to facilities, and forcibly exposing them to these drugs and studying them. More experiments that we see done by the military, the CIA, and and just the government in general is the Willowbrook experiment, which a lot of people are not aware of. And this was something that uh, they, it's it's kind of you know it's rough, guys. Uh, it's gonna be hard to hear, but this is the shocking Willowbrook experiments that were aimed at discovering a cure for hepatitis. The continuous study lasted from 1956 to 1970. The subjects were taken from Willowbrook State School, which is located in Staten Island, New York. They were mentally handicapped children, and the series of tests involved injecting the children with experimental drugs that were meant to cure hepatitis. Not only were the children unable to provide consent, but they would often die from the treatments. When questioned about their actions, officials justified themselves by stating that hepatitis was prevalent in the institution, and nearly all patients would become infected in any way. The children did not contract the disease naturally, the children who did not contract the disease naturally were infected by the administrators to carry on the experiment. Guys, this is just a predecessor to COVID-19 and the, the worldwide experiment that we're watching now. What are they telling you now? Oh, you don't have it yet? You'll get it soon. So therefore, let us inject it into you with, with this uh, supposed medicine that's supposed to counteract it. It's all been done before, guys. It's all been done before. Operation Mockingbird. This one was directly by the CIA itself, not just a cooperative um, offshoot. This one is an alleged large-scale program. And I say alleged, but guys, come, come on. It's a large-scale program of the United States Central Intelligence Agency that began in the early years of the Cold War and attempted to manipulate news media for propaganda purposes. So guys, even though the official narrative is that, oh, this is an alleged thing, right? No, literally in Congress, I think it was uh, in 2019 or 2017, um, the CIA was was testifying before Congress, and they asked them, they asked the CIA directly, one of the congressmen asked them, are you trying to tell me that there are your agents, your CIA agents in all the different news agencies on TV right now? And the CIA guy responds with, well, we'll have to finish this conversation off the record in private. And he wouldn't answer the question, because literally Operation Mockingbird has been going on since the 60s. So if you ever wondered, if you've ever seen those those funny little clips on, on YouTube or other social media floating around where it has all the different, you know, places all over the United States and they're they're repeating almost verbatim the same news story 
over and over and over from different news agencies all over the states. Yeah, it's because they're all being controlled. It's it's not the fault of the you know of the lady or the guy that's reading the report. Literally, they're paid to get up there, get their makeup on, look pretty, and read the information that's put in their hand. They don't write the information. Someone else does. This is what's called propaganda for behavioral control. Social media. Bum, bum, bum. This is actually from CBS News themselves. Okay. So if they're being controlled by the CAA, then the CAA is outright admitting they control and monitor and scan social medias as well. But I think most of us have already known this. It says you don't need to wear a tinfoil hat to believe that the CIA is using Facebook, Twitter, and Google and other social media to spy on people. That's because the CIA publishes a helpful list of press releases on all the social media ventures it sponsors via its technology investment arm in QTEL. The company that takes in QTEL's monies aren't shy about publicizing what they're up to either. Most recently, GeoSymbol announced an update to its Geo X ray product, which monitors social media chatter based on location. So whenever you see ads on your social media sites and on Google, a part of that is one of these biggest advertising agencies in the world called InQtel, which is owned by the CIA. So that's how they get, that's their plausible deniability to gain access to the algorithm of the site is that they're just the sponsor, they're sponsoring the companies whose advertisements are being bought by these social medias to help them make money. But through the backdoor code, it allows them to, to data mine all kinds of pertinent information from the users. By the way, Lighthouse will not be doing that. So that's where they're literally telling you right here, all of it, you know, you know they're scanning your social media. It's this tool for the CIA to actually spy on the, on the American people or anyone in any country. So let's look at a unique, a, a unique story that was written by the Catholic Herald in 2016, where it actually, he talks about why Catholics seem to do really well in the CIA. <laughs> it's just hilarious to me. So this is, um, it says three out of the last five CIA directors have been Catholic, Michael Hayden, Leon Panetta, and the current director, John Brennan. Now, looking back, a number of Catholics led the agency in critical periods during the Cold War. Some of the most influential directors in CIA history have been Catholic, men such as Walter Biddle Smith, John McCone, William Colby, and William Casey. They were not just casual Catholics. These were devout mass goers in many cases and members of groups like the Knights of Malta. Guys, what did we talk about at the beginning of this presentation? The Knights of Malta, the Knights of Columbus, they're just an offshoot. They take the same Jesuit oath as the actual Jesuit oath. They're just an offshoot of Jesuits. Literally, the, the Catholic Herald, written this article written by William Vargas of in May 5th, 2016, and with titled... Why Catholics thrive in the CIA? They're literally Jesuits, Jesuit plants. Literally, like it's just that it's just that easy. Here's William Casey, one of the guys that was mentioned, who's a part of the Knights of Malta. This is his famous quote. He was the CIA director from 1981, 1987. That's yes, during the Ronald Reagan years. For all of you out there that might be watching this, who are extreme fans of Ronald Reagan, he says. We'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the America public believes is false. That was in 1980. That was 30 years ago, guys. Uh, 30, 35, almost 40 years ago. That's then. Now add another 20 years on from the approximate 20 years from the inception of the CIA. Um, guys, they've been doing this for a long time. It's, they're literally telling you that they're treating the, the society of the United States like a big experiment. They're providing disinformation for propaganda. They're taking the practices, the medical, the psychological, the cultural, revolutionary, and societal changes from literal Nazis, as well as being directed by the papacy. Now, I'm not, I'm not about to tell you, I know a lot of people be upset, I'm not about to tell you that the United States is Mother Babylon. It's not. I'm going to go talk about that in the last two episodes of this series. And I'm not about to tell you that the Mother Church of the Holy Roman Mother Church of Rome and, and the Vatican is not Mother Babylon. I think it's the whore that rides the beast, but it's not Mother Babylon. So we'll get there. Be patient with me. Thanks for continuing to, to check out this series. But we're reading right here 
The Jesuits are the militia, the militant arm of assassins, political infiltrators of the Pope, directly connected to the CIA in the United States. And as you guys know, the CIA is not just operating within the United States, but it also operates all over the world. Famously, infam infamously, I should say. Notoriously. This says the American section of the Sovereign Mil Military Order of Malta has about 1,000 members, including 300 dames. They represent the vanguard of Ameri American Catholicism, the point at which the Vatican and the U.S. ruling elite intersect. The Knights of Malta comprise what is perhaps the most exclusive club on earth. They are more than the Catholic aristocracy. They can pick up a telephone and chat with the Pope. This is by historian Stephen Birmingham. Now we're going to get into Opus Dei. This is another offshoot. That's why their logo looks very much like the Jesuit logo. Of all the groups that are engaged in the U.S.-sponsored campaign against liberation theology, none has played a more significant role than Opus Dei, which is, translates as God's work, a fast-growing Catholic lay society whose political activities are shrouded in secrecy. Opus Dei was founded in 1928 by Jose Maria Escriva de Balagur, a young Spanish priest and lawyer. By the way, guys, they're all priests. The Jesuits, they're all nominated. I didn't have time to go into that, but if you want to do your own research on, on how the Jesuits are uh, given that position, they become a priest as they become into the Jesuit order. It's a perversion of the Levites of God. It's a perversion of the, the high priesthood of God, who is to be a defender of Torah, who is to be a defender of the Father's behavior, of his covenant behavior, his righteous, which means good behavior, his right behavior, the Levite priests and high priests, they were supposed to defend that good behavior, to know it, to do it better than the average Israelite in the covenant of Israel with God. They were supposed to be a defender of that, not political subversion, military infiltration, psychological warfare experiments to get the other nations of the countries to degrade them, to experiment on them. To not, That's a perversion. This is why you just read the Jesuit oath. They call it a covenant because it is a covenant to them. They're going into co blood covenant with death. They're going to blood covenant with the idea of becoming an assassin that doesn't question and just does whatever he's told. It's a perversion. They're called priests. Yeah, okay. But they're priests of, of, uh, of Rome. But ultimately, it's of the system of Babylon, which is controlled by the dragon. All right, so they're literally priests of their cult priests. They just don't realize they're, they're not calling themselves that, but that's literally what they would be called back in the days of ancient Israel. So it says uh, today there are more than 70,000 members. This is crazy, guys, of Opus Dei. More than 70,000 members. This was, an, this was an offshoot of Jesuits. And in 87 countries, only a small percentage are priests. The rest are mostly middle and upper class businessmen, professionals, military personnel, and government officials. <laughs> here's, here's their freshman class. Here's the first year that they organized Opus Dei. I just, it's crazy to me that they all just want to dress in black. It's just hilarious to me. It's just, it's just a, I mean, I, you know, that seems kind of superficial, but you're like, oh yeah, but the priests of, of, uh, of Israel, they all, you know, wore the white linen. They, they looked nice. They wore white because it represented the resurrection robes they're going to get at the resurrection. These guys literally covenant covenanted with death to dress like death. It's, it's interesting. This is a guy who came out of Opus Day, right? So he actually broke out, defected, and he tried to tell a testimony. He says, much of what is known about Opus Day comes from ex-members such as John Roche, a professor at Oxford University in England. He broke, it, he broke his oath of secrecy after leaving the order. According to Roche, self-flagellation with whips and spiked chains is a normal part of the rigid spiritual discipline that Opus Dei imposes on its full-time members, including college-age recruits of both genders. Personal identity suffers a severe battering. Some are reduced to shadows of their former selves. It's called psychological manipulation. They're brain controlled. This is part of it's a variant form of the NK Ultra, except without the drugs. It's through physical torture. This is, yeah, this is common with cults, right? It says others become severely disturbed. You mean possessed? I don't think that's what I meant to say, but yeah, well, that's another that's another video. Roche wrote this in a paper called The Inner World of Opus Dei. Internally, it's a totalitarian and imbued with fascist ideas turned to religious purposes, ideas which were surely drawn from the Spain of its early years. 
It is virtually a sect or cult in spirit, a law unto itself, totally self-centered, grudgingly accepting Roman authority because it still considers Rome orthodox and because of the vast pool of recruits accessible to it as a respected Catholic organization. Dr. Roche describes Opus Dei as an Orwellian world employing much doublethink and internal and external deception. Yet, what do we read? They're comprised of, what does it say? As of professionals, upper class businessmen, military personnel, government officials, priests. Let's look at the scriptures. What does the Father have to say on things like this? Should any of us become a part of these, go through an oath to be a part of these organizations, to be inducted into Knights of Malta, Knights of Columbus, the Jesuit Order, Opus Dei, any of these other groups, or even Freemasonry. You become what's called an initiate who gets inducted into the order, which is their little sect, their cult, their club. Okay. Well, I want to give a big shout out to Gareth Guest. I'm not sure if he's in the in the chat tonight, but he actually pointed this out a couple months ago in the Septuagint. Uh, you guys probably know we like to have cross reference Septuagint Sept 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 when we're reading the scriptures because it has a lot of things that were left out of the Masoretic. Septuagint um, translation came around approximately 1,100 years before the Masoretic translation of the Bible. And it was originally in Greek. So in Deuteronomy 23, 17 in the Septuagint, Yahweh says this, There shall not be a harlot of the daughters of Israel, and there shall not be a fornicator of the sons of Israel. There shall not be an idolater of the daughters of Israel, and there shall not be an initiated person of the sons of Israel. Why would he say that? You guys also remember just a few chapters earlier, he's talking about those who practice witchcraft, mediums, spiritists, diviners, those who are false prophets, Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 18, goes on to Deuteronomy 23 to express, in addition to all those behaviors, the, the harlots, the daughters of Israel, the fornicators, the sons of Israel, that'd be people that participate in the temple worship, where they would have the male and female prostitutes and the other people when they do their worship, after they come into the threshold of the temple, of the temple, the pagan temple to Baal, they then go and offer their sacrifice, and then go in and, and participate in the activities in the temple, which usually involve male and female prostitutes. In that same way, he would say, "You not do not become an initiate of that institution." That means you're you're not just a participant in that in that cult, which was called the you know the the cult of Baal, the cult of Apollo. You're not just a participant, but you actually become a part of their priesthood as well. Yeah, Yahweh is directly telling them, Jeremiah 20 through 17, do not become an initiate into that. Let's look at some examples here. 1 Samuel 5, 1 through 5. After the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. They carried it into the temple of Dagon and set it beside his statue. When the people of Ashdod got up early the next morning, there was a there was Dagon fallen on his face before the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and returned him to his place. But when they got up early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face before the Ark of the Lord again, with his head and his hands broken off, lying on the threshold. Only the torso remained. That is why, to this day, priests of Dagon and all who enter the temple of Dagon and Ashdod do not step on the threshold. So was, this is a ritual that they adopted when the Philistines had captured the Ark and they tried to set it inside the Temple of Dagon. This happens as a result. And then a superstition arose that they are not going to step on the threshold when they enter into the Temple of Dagon. So what they do is they make a big deal about crossing the threshold at that point, from that point forward, with the going into their pagan occult temples. Zephaniah 1, 7 through 9. The father actually reprimands is, is speaking to the rebellious and he's talking about some of their practices and how he's going to wipe away all that nonsense in the future. And he says in verse 7, Be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. Indeed, the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. On the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the princes, the sons of the king, and all who are dressed in foreign apparel. On that day, I will punish all who leap over the threshold, who fill the house of their master with violence and deceit. What are the Jesuits supposed to do? They serve their master to go implore violence and deceit. They serve a false god under a false priesthood. And who are those people recruiting out of? 
All these secret societies that we talked about that are at the high level, they recruit down out of the feeder secret societies who practice the same things. And we're going to read about that here in just a minute. Jeremiah chapter 5, 20 through 24 Yahweh says, declare this in the house of Jacob and proclaim it in Judah. Hear this, O foolish and senseless people who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear. Do not fear me, declares Yahweh. Do not tremble before me, the one who set the sand as the boundary for the sea, an enduring barrier it cannot cross. The waves surge, but they cannot prevail. They roar, but cannot cross it. But these people have stubborn and rebellious hearts. They've turned aside and gone away. They've not said in their hearts, let us fear God, our, our Elohim. Let us fear Yahweh, our, our Elohim who gives the rains both autumn and spring and season, who keeps for us the appointed weeks of harvest. Your iniquities have diverted these from you. Your sins have deprived you of my bounty. For among my people are wicked men. They Let's check this out. For among my people are wicked men. What's going on in the days of Jeremiah, guys? This is leading into um, the time of the southern house of the kingdom of Judah being invaded by Nebuchadnezzar and taken into exile into Babylon. And there was great, great apostasy in the kingdom of Judah by not just the priesthood, but also the rulers, the kings, and even the people. This is why in Jeremiah 3, 8 through 10, it says that the kingdom of Judah was more treacherous than the, than the northern house of Israel. It says right here, fathers, Yahweh is telling them, my people, among my people are wicked men. They watch like fowlers lying in wait. They set a trap to catch men like cages full of birds. So their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they've become powerful and rich. They've grown fat and sleek and would have excelled in the deeds of the wicked. They have not taken up the cause of the followers they might pro that they might prosper, nor have they defended the rights of the needy. Should I not punish them for these things, declares Yahweh? Should I not avenge myself on an, such a nation as this? A horrible and shocking thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule by their own authority. My people love it, So, but what will you do in the end? The people were rebelling because the leaders had rebelled, the kings and the priests. And specifically in the days of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, this is why Ezekiel 44, 7 through 9, Yahweh has to reaffirm in the future, I'll never let an uncircumcised or a foreigner come into my house because that's what they were allowing to do. If you go read Ezekiel chapter 8 or chapter 7 and 8, Yahweh shows Ezekiel through a vision what's actually happening in the inner chambers of the temple. They're worshiping Helios. They're worshiping Dagon. They're worshiping the sun gods. They're worshiping Apollo. Literally, there's 25 people bowing down to the east and worshiping an idol inside Yahweh's temple. And if, if we take the inference of Ezekiel 44, 7 through 9 and what, what I'm reading right here, these are not people that are, um, they're not circumcised in their heart or in their flesh. They're not trying to be in covenant with Yahweh, but they're using his building and profaning his name by worshiping other gods. This is the same practice. And these people are full of deceit. They're lying in wait to catch people. Right, because they're trying to deceive people, guys. This is um, what Yahweh recommend uh, reprimanded the northern house and the southern house over a, a long time period. But you know, the, the prophet Elijah had to deal with Jahab and Ezebel going into the days of Isaiah, leading up to the days of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. It was a long time period. They were going through this mass rebellion it, in spurts and in different segments and groups. And there was a moment of shining Hezekiah. Then it went back and went to the NASA and there was like good and bad. And it was, it wasn't consistent. And ultimately they were, they were um, envying. This is what Isaiah, I can't remember the chapter right now, but um, the people of the Northern house have been reprimanded by Isaiah for envying the Assyrians because they were inter trading with these people, Mary intermarrying against the covenant. They were getting caught up, and being seduced politically by other nations from within. Guys, this is what we read in the Jesuit Oath. This is the same people, the same behavior. And they practice literally the same superstitions and the same occult initiation rituals. They worship the same gods. They have the same symbols of the same gods. Guys, Babylon has been trying to infiltrate Israel forever. And any nation that tries to be good, any people group that tries to be good, the little tentacles are sent out through their spies of infiltrators politically, violently at times to try to get in and get people away from covenant behavior to Yahweh and take them into the, the covenant behavior of Babylon. And we're going to talk about that in, in, in the part 21 of this series. We talk about the, the war of the two kingdoms. We're going to go into that much further, but I'm just going to give you a preface right now. 
guys, you guys ready to read about <laughs> this crazy thing, which is the actual ceremony of the first degree ceremony of masonry? It's crazy. The, so this is something that this is just like a, I don't know who made this. It's just from the, the Grand Lodge um, of Beershire, Berkshire. But it's just a quick little guide. It's, it's hilarious. It's actually a, a quick start guide for initiation of the first degree in Freemasonry. And this is the newly admitted entered apprentice and a proposed appointee as a personal mentor. And then they're going to speak with the master and then they're going to go through the actual lodge. So, but let's just look down here real quick. This is some key points is this is a quick start guide, right? It says your preparation outside the lodge, each part of your preparation had meaning. Some of the symbolism was explained later by the worshipful master. Other parts are explained in the lectures of the three degrees of craft Freemasonry. Look at number two. You took the first step across the threshold. I don't know if you guys can see this. I'm sorry. One second. Here we go. So number two says you took the first step across the threshold into the open lodge and met the first challenge. Although the crossing, this is crazy, guys. Although the crossing of the threshold in this manner is significant, it is only the first part of the whole ceremony, which is described later as your admission amongst Masons. They don't tell you that when you cross the threshold into the lodge, it's super significant. And it, it is them allowing you admission into their as an initiate into their cult. They only tell you that after you're done. This is an initiation ceremony. What do we read from Deuteronomy 23, 17? Let no man of Israel be an initiate. Do not participate in secret societies and the cults. It's a cult. And they literally, in this particular cult, in the free man, one of the most well, well-renowned all across the world with lodges everywhere all across the world. Supposedly, even there's a lodge in Antarctica. It's crazy. There's Freemason, there's there's Freemasonic lodges everywhere. There's a huge temple to, to George Washington in Washington, D.C. They literally call their buildings temples, by the way. And the moment that you cross the threshold of their temple do your initiation, initiation ceremony, that's basically, whether you knew it or not, you're becoming one of them is a big deal. The threshold was a big deal to them, just like it was to Baal and Dagon cults, which are offshoots of Babylon. It's the same people, the same practices, the same deceptions, the same instruments, if you will, of disrupting civilizations, steering behavioral modification of civilizations. Guys, you always realize there was masses of amounts of drugs and alcohol at the, at the Baal temples and Dagon temples where they did their, their ceremonies. That was one of the reasons why it was so enticing for people. You, you literally, their version of going to church and worshiping their God was taking drugs and having sex, getting drunk. Like it's it's crazy. Absolutely, absolutely insane, guys. Nothing's new under the sun. It's all the same. It's all the same behaviors. It's all the same. Um, it's the, it's the ways of Babylon, and for each culture and each new new era, if you will, each new big shift in societies, they have to figure out a way. How are we going to do the same behaviors, but we've got to figure out a way to either get better at it or sneakier with it or change it up a little bit, rebrand it a little bit so people don't realize this is what we were doing 300 years ago or even 20 years ago. Uh, I didn't even get to one of the, the worldwide experiments that they did. The, remember, we talked about how the the idea of the first um, uh, the first Jesuits and all that. There were uh, Opus Dei. And they were all excuse me, not not that um, the Nazis and the behavioral modification experiment that Himmler was the Italian fascist scientists and the Nazis that they brought back together after World War II. The United States brought them back together under um, under the, what used to be the OSS, but then became the CIA. And they brought them back together to start Project Monarch, which led to Project MTA Ultra, where they worked with uh, microbiology and pharmacology for mind manipulation and mind control, behavioral modification. That's pharmacology. I mean, it's, that's that's pharmacia. That's that's always been a part of Babylon. It's always been a part of it. They tried to entice you into their system, their society, which. The guy who broke out, uh, that that professor from Oxford, I can't remember his name right now, who broke out of the Opus Dei cult, you know, he was just saying, look, 
it's Orwellian and it's double think, right? They want you to do this, but all the behaviors are opposite of that. And sometimes their language is opposite of that. We see that all the time. And I mean, we've seen that how much in the last year and a half with the amazing amounts of double think and double speak that we've seen from the U.S. government and from uh, all the news agencies pertaining to this supposed worldwide pandemic. So, I mean, this is the same, the same kind of stuff. Yeah, prodigal son. I didn't have time to go into Mormonism. You're right. They're also founded by a Mason. Um, Joseph Smith was a Mason. I mean, they're. It's all the same, guys. It's it's just they have to they have to like I said they have different offshoots. They have different you know little lesser secret societies that don't have as much power that they recruit from. To find out, that's why you get to you know thirty third degree. Suddenly, you can become somewhat high level, according to that. Whether you're in the Scottish Rite or the York Rite, um, then you can get up into the higher levels. Whether it's the Club of Rome or the actual Illuminati or Opus Dei or different things like that. So yeah, I mean they're they but they have a hierarchy within their system. That's like we read the quote from Adolf Hitler. He said, "I I took the Jesuits hierarchy organizational structure because I thought it was great. I thought it was wonderful." It's crazy, guys. It's crazy. This is uh, just trying to show you that the idea of Babylon and its it, all of its different machinations throughout society and throughout history has always been the same. I mean, we've talked about this another time, like we part ten and part eleven. We talked about the the practices of Babylon. I went over these big overarching ideas, the big five. But this kind of gets into some more detailed ones that are talking about cultural revolution and change, specifically that the scriptures talk about as well, and they practice the same superstitions. They even call them the same things, the initiates, and they are cults. They're they're a cult just like the Apollo, Apollo cults, the Baal cults, the Dagon cults. They're cults, Osiris cults, the cults of death. All of it at the top of that hierarchy of that cult is the dragon, and we'll be talking about him later.